It was Christmas Eve, 1982. As was customary for our family, we had our gathering at the old farm outside of Bloomfield that was built by our ancestors after immigrating from Germany. It was a unique house. My great-great-grandfather Carl and his brother Hans came to Nebraska around 1890, as most young immigrants did, and still do, to start a new life in the new world. They combined what money they had and bought a plot of land north in northeastern Nebraska, nearby a new township called Bloomfield. The story goes they got a good deal on the land because it was so riddled with stones and large rocks that no one could farm it. However, Carl and Hans were from a long line of stonemasons and were raised in the trade at very young ages. When they arrived on their new plot of land, what everyone else viewed as a drawback they saw as an opportunity. When they began to plow the land, every stone and rock they had to dig up, they put to use building their home. And since then, there was a lot of rocks and boulders buried, neath, buried underneath the land. It wasn't long before they crafted not only a good-sized two-story house, but also a massive barn that was adjacent to the house. Structures that have weathered the worst weather Nebraska could throw at them over the centuries. This was the house that my great-grandma Frida was born and raised in, along with her cousins that, that lived there as well. Over time, this family grew, weathering hardships and tragedies, some choosing to stay in the area, some choosing to find their own adventures elsewhere in the country. But we always came together at Christmas, back at this old house that still stands. There were many upgrades and changes done to the house over the decades, many done before I was even born, but it still remain, uh, retained its history, especially one particular room that used to be great-grandma's old bedroom. It was a smaller room, furnished with a single bed and a small wardrobe-style closet, but there was a large picture, picture window, three-quarters the size of the far wall, with a few of the back area, a backyard area, leading into the thick grove of trees. It was here where I found Great Ma, sitting and rocking in her rocking chair, staring out the window with, with an old book closed on her lap. The festivities of the evening were winding down. My family arrived on the farm earlier in the afternoon after a journey in a cramped car with my two younger siblings and what seemed to take forever. I couldn't wait to play with my cousins and eat grandma's cheesy potatoes and open the presents later that evening. And we did, along with watching the animated Christmas specials that were broadcast that night on grandma and grandpa's big ancient color television. After the adrenaline of the night had dispersed and us children had settled down for, to a dull roar, I went off by myself to explore the old house. I did, I did that whenever I visited. Back then, everything seemed bigger, more mysterious, especially the old farm. I wasn't a girl who was easily scared whenever I did, and where, whenever I and the other cousins went to explore, I was the first one to check out the dark, shadowy, and scary rooms in the house, as well as the numerous other outbuildings that were added to the farm over time. The spider webs and their spiders, mice, and various other critters didn't startle me or make me go running. I would always imagine that I was an adventurer from one, one of my books to discover treasure or rescue one of my cousins from the evil dragon slash wizard slash big bad evil whatever. Some of my aunts and uncles found this very unbecoming of a young girl. My parents, on the other hand, accepted having a tom girl for a daughter. This particular Christmas Eve, I was roaming the dark, drafty hallways of the house, my mind wandering a bit, when I came across Great Ma's old, old bedroom. The door was open, so I peeked inside. The room was mostly dark, save for an oil, uh, old oil lantern that was lit, casting its flickering light from the top of the small wardrobe on which it was placed. Seated next to this light, in the rocking chair that, I was told, came from the old world along with my great-great-grandpa, was, was Great Ma, positioned diagonally, staring out the window and rocking slowly in the chair. There was a bittersweet look on her face. Forgetting my nocturnal adventure, I stepped silently into the room I could... 
I could almost immediately sense a kind of magic in the air inside this room, the kind that I always seemed to feel each time I opened a new book or walked inside a library. It was a feeling that excited and frightened me at the same time. Instinctively, I took, I took in a deep breath like I was trying to capture that aroma. I must have disturbed Great Ma's thinking. She stopped rocking and turned her head to look at me. Who's there? She asked. It's me, Great Ma, I answered, embarrassed from disturbing her like that. Uh, like that. I saw Great Ma smile wide. Little Janet, she exclaimed. Come in, little one. Come in and know me better. I smiled and went inside. She was always quoting from her favorite Christmas story on Christmas Eve, so I recognized the invitation. I sat down on the edge of the bed next to her chair. She held out her frail hand and I took it. She squeezed my hand and I squeezed back. Are you the ghost of Christmas present? I asked playfully. She chuckled, a mischievous twinkle in her eye as she looked at me. You may be right. I just might be, she answered. Then an oddly sad look came over her face for just an instant. I looked down on her lap to the book that I saw when, that I saw when coming in. It was a small, very old book, the size of a modern mass market paperback, excuse me, but done in hardcover. The cover may have been done in a bright green, but over time it had been worn down to a dull dark green. Years of dust and grime and the oil and sweat of fingers reading and rereading maybe hundreds of times had given this book a uh, characteristic all its own. The title of the book, stamped on the front cover in gold, was faded, but I could still make it out in the faint light of the lamp. A Christmas Carol by Charles Dickens. Naturally, she always had it around this time of year. She noticed me looking at the book. She smiled and picked it up, looking at it lovingly. Ah, yes, she said, this old friend of mine. I got this on a Christmas Eve long ago when I was your age, as a matter of fact. She looked back out the window into the distance. This was also the night our family was visited by two very odd strangers, travelers, if you will. She looked back at me, the twinkle in her eyes dancing. Would you like to hear that tale, my dear? She asked. I nodded my head excitedly. Well then, she looked back out the window, the book back on her lap, but still holding on to it. Like I said, I was your age on this particular Christmas Eve. And I and all of the family that lived in this big house were all gathered together in the fireplace room, which was and still is the largest part of this house. We had stopped bringing in one, one of the evergreens to decorate a couple of years back after that squirrel incident. But we decorated the walls, the fireplace, everything inside. She looked at me, a small smile on her lips. Christmas was always a magical time for this family. Even the grown-ups never lost their sense of, that sense of wonder. She took a deep breath and looked back out the window. That night, it was the same. We mostly made the presents that we gave each other back then, and we cherished them all. That year, Uncle Hans and had hand-carved wooden toy guns for all the boys, and Aunt Miriam uh, made hand-sewn dolls for all the girls, complete with homemade dresses and bonnets. My father and mother, however, had given me me this book here. She patted the book. It was brand new back then, something they purchased from the general store in Bloomfield. Between the two, I considered the book the greatest gift. She chuckled. Of course, back then it was considered, let's say, odd for a girl to want to read all the time. I received a considerable, a considerable amount of ribbing at the hands of my aunt and cousins, along with my own siblings, because of my love of reading and learning. Aunt Miriam wasn't too pleased that I left the doll that she made for me untouched, preferring to sit near the fireplace on the floor and read my new book. Soon after all the gifts were exchanged, Father and Uncle Hans left the house to tend to the animals and evening chores. The children were allowed to remain and play with their gifts. Ten minutes after they left, however, Uncle Hans swung the opened the door, an excited look on his face, rattling off commands to the boys in German. He never bothered to learn English. He always considered it to be bah humbug. Great Ma giggled at the reference. It, it was why we all learned both English and German so we could understand what Uncle Hans was yelling at us about. 
It was common German, mind you. If father and uncle Hans wanted to talk privately around us, they would just speak high, speak in high German. Is she bothering you, Grandma? A loud, booming voice startled me. I looked behind us, and Uncle Dennis's head was poking through the doorway, the permanent scowl directed at me. No, she's not. I was telling her a story, Great Ma replied. A look of annoyance crossed her face. She should be getting ready for bed with the rest of the children, Uncle Dennis replied, looking like he was going to step in and grab me from the bed. I cowered a bit. She's fine where she's at. Something something in Great, Ma, Great Ma's voice made him stop dead in his tracks. Now, I said I was telling her a story, and she will go to bed when I'm good and finished doing so. Now, shoo, get out. Uncle Dennis shot another disapproving glance at me, then, without saying a word, turned around and went down the hall. Great Ma snorted. He's not even the oldest of the grandchildren, but he always has to be the one in charge. She looked at me again, that recognizable twinkle flashing. He's all bark and no bite. Everyone knows this. This There's no need to be afraid of that bully. I smiled, relieved. She straightened up a bit and looked back out the window. Now, where was I? Oh, yes. Uncle Hans was instructing the oldest boys to put on their coats and boots, saying that he and father found something strange lying in the snow near the barn. There was something about blood. I was really curious, so I also put on my coat and boots to join them. That got a disapproving look from my aunt, but I was known to join my father and the boys in their adventures, so nothing was said to stop me from doing this. It was snowing slightly that night, and the snow wasn't considerably deep, maybe slightly above my ankles. We fo followed Father and Uncle Han's footprints around to the front of the barn, where we found him knelt over a dark figure lying in the snow. As we got closer, we noticed there were patches of red in the snow, darker and more abundant around the figure. When we got there, Father looked up, the light of his lantern showing a body we had never seen the likes of before. It was my size, smaller and human in shape, and looked like she was dressed head to toe in a fur suit. Only, as we got closer, it was very apparent that the fur suit was really its actual fur covering the body of what we at first thought was an animal. Only, I could tell there was something different about this one. For starters, I could tell just by studying the body that this creature walked upright on two legs. The feet were larger than regular human feet, but contained five toes each, just like we did. There were arms with hands that were bigger than mine, but again had four fingers and a thumb. I remember years before when tra a traveling circus came through Bloomfield on their way to Wayne. They stopped for the night, and we all went to look at the animals they had. One of them was a chimpanzee, which is what my older brother William suggested this animal, animal that lay before us was. Only I remember vividly that that ape look, what that ape looked like, and this wasn't it. It was the face. It was mostly covered in fur, but it looked more human than ape. Their eyes were open, and it was breathing, the breath visible in the cold night air. The eyes, though, they were afraid. It was looking right at us, and I could tell fear was registering in those eyes. I can't imagine what she thought, and yes, the creature turned out to be female. I could tell without looking too closely. There was a shotgun wound on her side. We didn't hear a shotgun going off while in the house, and neither of, my, of the ones of my uncle and father brought with them looked like they were fired recently. One of my cousins pointed out that there were larger footprints leading out from the grove of trees, ending where she was laying. Father found her like that, so chances are she was shot while in the grove by another person. Father had stopped the bleeding and had used the handkerchief as a bandage for the wound. Come, everyone, into the barn, he said. We all helped to carry her gently into the large barn, getting us all out of the cold. She didn't move or struggle. I don't know how much blood she lost or if she was so terrified she couldn't move to fight back. After what happened later, I'm pretty sure none of us would have survived if she did, but I'm getting ahead of myself. Great Ma turned to me again. Are you enjoying the story? Do you wish for me to, to continue? I was transfixed. I nodded my head furiously, urging her on. She seemed delighted at my enthusiasm. Well, 
after we got her situated on a bed of hay in the back, close to where they built a backpack, uh, back passage back into the house, Uncle Hans instructed us all to let him and Father explain what happened to the women folk in the house. He also instructed all of us to never speak of this to anyone outside of the farm. Both my father and uncle seemed to know more about this than they let on, especially with the treatment of the creature. I decided to stay with her to maybe bring some comfort and pull it, put her at ease. When everyone went back into the house, I sat down in front of her and smiled. She still seemed tense. Hi, I said, waving a little. My name is Frida. This is my home. Well, not this part. This is the home for our animals. I live just past that door. I pointed at the door that led into the house, and those were my brothers and cousins that just left. The two big men were my uncle and father. They were the ones who found you. She did seem to relax a bit. Maybe she could understand me? I decided to test this theory, so I asked, Do you have a father? A family? Her eyes widened, and she actually smiled a little. Then she started nodding her head. I was surprised. She could understand me. Whatever this was, maybe she wasn't human, but she was close to one that I could understand. I was hit with an idea. I stood up, which startled her a bit. I held out my hands to put her at ease. Stay here, I said. I'm going inside to get something, and I'll be back in just a minute. I then turned and went through the door, down the short hallway, into the back of the house. I went as fast as I could to the fireplace room, where I left the doll and left my doll and my book. I grabbed those, ignoring the protests from everyone to take the boots off in the house, and went as fast as I could back to the barn through the back entrance. But when I got back, she was gone. She was no longer on her bed of hay. I, I searched the barn, and I couldn't find her. I sank down on my knees near the hay and began crying. I had lost her. She was alone and scared and probably ran off. I had failed my father. But then I heard a rustling in the hay beside me. I looked. And I saw what appeared to be a shape of the hay moving, but it wasn't the hay. Slowly, that shape began to fill in the fur and look of the girl creature until she was back on the bed of hay, looking wide-eyed at me. I was amazed at what I saw. Wow, I said, is that the way you hide from bad things? She nodded back. Then she glanced at what I had brought from the house. I held out the doll to her. Here, this is for you, I said. She looked curiously at the doll, sniffing at it, then slowly reaching for it. <clears throat> she finally took it from me, looked it, up, uh, looked it up and down, and then finally held it close to her like she was hugging it. I then held up the book and said, this is my book, which I'm going to read to you. I then opened it and began to tell her the tale contained within, the story of old Ebenezer and the night he was visited by four ghosts to learn the true meaning of Christmas. I itch. It was a story I knew well. Great Ma would read it to us every Christmas Eve since even before I was born. I may have even heard it while still in my mother's womb. And no other telling of that story, either read or recreated in a play or film, has come close to how Great Ma made the story come alive for all of us. Well, for me, anyway. I had gotten to the middle of the book, Great Ma continued. When, from outside of the barn, I could hear dogs barking. It wasn't, it wasn't our family dog, and there were maybe two of them out there. Then, following that, I heard voices, human voices, none of them belonging to any of my family, shouting at the dogs and each other. They were speaking English, but they sounded vaguely French. The voices stopped at the big doors of the barn. Then, there then came a loud banging on those doors, followed by one of the men outside shouting, Open up! I know it's in there! My father came bursting through the back door entrance, wearing only his long johns, his boots, and coat, carrying his rifle with him. He glanced quick, quickly at us to make sure we were still safe, and then shouted, Who's there? while making towards the big doors at the front. You have something that is ours, one of the voices outside yelled back. Let us have it back, and no one will get hurt. Frightened, I looked over at my new friend, but she was no longer visible once again. 
Oh, how I wish I had that ability at that moment. My father opened one of the doors to talk with them. I couldn't hear what they were saying, but the ones outside sounded very angry and yelled over what father was saying. Finally, they forced their way inside the barn. There were three of them, each carrying shotguns and dressed in large fur coats with belts that, various, that carried various pouches and gun holsters. They made their way to the back of the barn where I was ignoring my father's protests. Soon, all three of them were standing over me, glaring down at me. I cowered away as much as I could. The one closest to me, with a wild scraggly beard and missing several teeth, spoke. Where is it? I know it's here. The dogs can smell it. I was paralyzed with fear. I couldn't talk, so the man pointed his shotgun at my face and said, I said, where is it, you filthy kraut? Father started shouting at them to leave me alone, but he was silenced by another one of the men who knocked him down by hitting him in the face with the butt of his own shotgun. I saw my father lay there, blood pouring out of his nose. Then, looking back at the man who had his shotgun pointed at my face, all I could do was shiver, not because of the cold. He smiled coldly, his finger moving to the trigger of the gun, and I knew he meant to shoot me then and there. But then, at that very second, a very loud roar came outside the barn, a roar that was unlike any I've heard it from any animal before. I saw the color drain from the men's faces, and they all turned back towards the door of the barn, moving swiftly. I then went over to my father to see if he was all right. The bleeding from his nose had stopped, and he was moaning and blinking his eyes. He was still alive. I rejoiced. Something very large hammered at the barn door, something that made the door shake and bulge in. This made the three men stop in their tracks and visibly shake themselves. Another boom, and I heard the doors crack. A third boom, and the door splintered open. At first, I only saw the darkness of the night beyond them. Then, the form of something standing twice the height of a fully grown man walked slowly in. This thing was easily twelve feet tall, and had, a hunch, had to hunch over to get inside through the doors. Once in, he was able to stand at his full height. He was muscular, bulky, covered from head to toe in fur, which was standing on end. He glared down at the three men, eyes wide and teeth bared. Before any of the men could snap out of their shock, the beast bellowed another roar right at them, causing them to drop their weapons. Great Ma looked at me and winked. I may have peed myself a little at that moment, too. I couldn't help but giggle. One of the men managed to come to and sprint underneath the beast's legs out of the barn. The other two weren't that lucky. The beast held them immobile with both his hands, and one by one leaned over and bit their faces clean off of their skulls. He then picked them up like ragdolls and threw them out of the front of the barn after their friend. Then he turned and looked at my father and me in the back. Pulling himself to full height, he walked slowly towards us, his eyes never leaving, leaving either of us. He stopped short where father's rifle fell to the ground where he was hit, looked at it, then looked back at us a bit more angry looking than before. He then covered the short distance between us, glared down, his chest puffing, uh, starting to puff out like he was making to roar once again, this time at us. I think both my father and I braced ourselves for this. I couldn't take my eyes off the spaceman, despite the inevitable. But then, suddenly, my new friend appeared out of thin air in front of him, her hands out, and speaking to him in a kind, uh, kind of patterned roar that sounded like a unique speech. The man beast paused. Le listening to her. He spoke something back in that special language. She answered, holding up the doll that I gave her. She looked back. He looked back at us while she turned and looked at both of us as well, clutching the doll to her chest. And then the most surprising thing happened. The beast man talked in English. My daughter tells me that you took her in, bound her wounds, cared for her, and protected her from the hunters. I thank you. He then spoke something to his daughter in their language. She turned and walked up to me and held the doll to me. I shook my head and said, no, it's yours. It's my Christmas gift to you. I saw her smile, say something in her language, and then she hugged me. She also hugged my father before waving goodbye 
and leaving her with her own father. Great Ma paused, taking a deep breath, looking out at the darkness of the trees. And as it turns out, she continued, that, that was what you would call a Bigfoot nowadays, particularly from a clan that normally dwells in North Dakota. Somehow they must have run afoul of some hunters from Quebec, if I remember their accents correctly, and were chased all the way down, down to here. She looked at me once again. That third one didn't, that escape wasn't so lucky, it seems. They found their bodies along with their dogs and horses, torn up and laying by the Nibrera River west of here. The authorities claimed it was wolves, was, <clears throat> the authorities claimed it was wolves that did the men. You and I know better, yes. I nodded again, my eyes wide at the story I was just told, but Great Ma wasn't finished. She picked up her book and gazed at it lovingly. Every Christmas Eve, I read this story aloud to my children, then grandchildren, and now my great-grandchildren. Because I love telling you all stories, yes, but mostly because it reminds me of that night, reading the story to a very frightened friend. She looked at me again, and every year after I've read the story, I sit in this Excuse me. I sit in this old room of mine and I fall asleep listening to this rocking chair. I fall asleep sitting in this rocking chair, waiting to see if maybe, just maybe, that friend would return again. Maybe to visit her old friend. Maybe to finish the story that I never got the chance to finish for her. She smiled, chuckled, and looked back at the book. Seems like a fool's errand. Something a senile old woman should stop doing, but maybe tonight. Who knows? Looking back at me, she smiled, pointing a finger at me, and that's the story, all true. Now, you need to get to bed, otherwise Santa won't be visiting us tonight. I giggled, then hugged her, said our goodnights, and scrambled off upstairs, where all the cousins were all sleeping. Sleep came a bit later for me that night. The images of the story Great Ma just told me continued to continuing to play out and replay itself in my head. But soon, sleep did take me, and I didn't wake up again until the sun poked itself over the eastern horizon. Great Ma was found that morning, si si still sitting up in her rocking chair, looking like she was asleep. She passed on that night peacefully. The doctor said she must have died sometime after midnight. That was fitting for her. She always loved Christmas, and she got to be surrounded by all of her family that she loved. It was melancholy, but we filled that Christmas with stories of, of our memories of the woman who held the family together throughout all the decades. Decades have passed since then. The family farm was eventually sold. The family tries to keep in touch as much as they possibly can. Mostly it's done online, but once every other year we try and have a reunion of sorts, mostly at Bloomfield, where our clan started. Admittedly, it's not the same, but we still fill our Christmas gatherings by keeping Great Ma alive, telling the next generation stories of her life and the stories she passed on to us. Of course, I feel blessed to have been the person she decided to tell her final story to. I haven't shared this story to anyone save for this particular journal entry. Will I tell anyone? I, I don't know. Maybe my own great-grandchildren if I'm lucky to live that long. However, the, there is one thing that I left out of this telling that I'm going to share now. What makes me question as to whether this was a true story or something she made up to entertain me is that when they found her that Christmas morning, in her lap, her beloved book was missing, and it, in its place was what looked like an old hand-sewn doll that was well-loved. December 25th, 2023.